Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Laura Allen with Greywater Action. Today's webinar topic is installing simple pumped gray water systems. We have a great presenter today, Lee Gerard from Greywater Core. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes that I want to let you know about. You can type in any questions um, that you have into the chat box on the left of your screen. Feel free to type them in at any time. We're going to pause a few times throughout the presentation to answer the questions in groups together, and then we'll also have time at the end to answer questions. Um, you can also view a larger screened version if you want to have the picture enlarged by clicking on the upper right of the slide. You'll get a, a fuller screen view. If you have any technology issues, feel free to type them in, and I could help troubleshoot you as the presentation is going. And without further ado, we're going to get started. Thank you, Lee, so much for presenting on our webinar today. You're welcome. Thanks. It's nice to be here. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, you probably know this, but I'm the principal of Greywater Core. We are a contractors primarily who design and install Greywater systems in Los Angeles. We've probably done several hundred systems by now, ranging from simple, super low tech, which is sort of our favorite preferred option, um, gravity flow, branch drains, laundry to landscape, things like that. But a lot of times we come up with situations where someone wants to spread the water over um, a broader area, not just downhill. Um, and so we might need a pump. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about um, how to incorporate pumps in, in simple ways into your projects. Um, so, um, this first slide shows sort of a general overview of the plumbing of the system. And we're going to talk a lot about the plumbing and how that looks and how to keep it safe and um, get permits and things like that. And then, and then later on, we'll also talk about how does the water actually get distributed in the environment. Um, so uh, these systems are simple, low tech. Usually it's basically like a sump pump. Uh, in the drawing that you see in front of you, this is, this is a drawing I usually give to contractors when if, if it's, for example, a new house that's going up and there will be a general contractor doing the plumbing, but then we're working in collaboration with him to do the gray water system. So I give him this and tell him to basically um, dual plumb the house. You've already talked about that, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but in this drawing, the darker lines are gray water and the lighter lines are sewer or black water. Uh, and so the gray water system is uh, fixtures are all plumbed independently from black water and stubbed out somewhere where the gray water system is going to be. This could be outside, it could be in the crawl space. Um, and at that point, there's a three port diverter valve, one inlet and two outlets. And then one outlet goes to the gray water pump and the other goes back to the sewer if you want to turn off your gray water system. Um, and so this is sort of the general overview of what it looks like. Uh, so we've got bathtubs, showers, and laundry, uh, and bathroom sinks um, are all going to gray water. Kitchen sinks and toilets are going to sewer. Um, so I'll do the next slide. Um, we do probably about a third of our jobs now are this kind of system. And it's kind of the middle ground between a super low tech gravity flow system and a super high tech thing with pump, you know, with filters and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, compared to a gravity flow system, the benefits are that you can irrigate anywhere, including uphill. Uh, you can spread the water out over an entire property. So a lot of times, especially in Los Angeles, there's a lot of hillside houses. There's a lot of places where people are irrigating front yards, backyards, side yards. Um, you can do that. If you have a pump, you can have multiple outlets. You know, with a branch drain, you might get about eight outlets maximum. With these, you can get up to 40 um, or more if you have um, different zones. They're relatively simple systems. So there is no storage of gray water. There's no filter. There, there is a pump, but there's, you know, it's, it sort of works by itself. So, um, and we, we did a lot of filtered systems in the past, things with um, sort of self, you know, things that the homeowner would have to clean a filter. Um, there's some proprietary brands out there. Uh, you'll, you might see them on the shelf or, or in websites. In our experience, all those systems became problems or almost all of them. And the reason is people do not change their filters. People, homeowners may swear to you that they will. 
And when it comes down to it, having to clean or replace a yucky gray water filter once a month is just something that doesn't get done. Um, so these systems avoid filters entirely. Um, so you can't use drip, drip line, they'll clog. There's stuff in gray water, but we get around it by using larger emitter outlets. You can irrigate vegetables, raised beds. Uh, you guys hopefully know the rules about that. You cannot irrigate, you know, the, the part that you're eating, the edible part of the, of the vegetable or fruit cannot be directly in contact with gray water. But as long as you do it sensibly and keep the gray water two inches underground, then you're going to be fine. Uh, these systems can be built with off the shelf components. So you don't have to buy a, you know, a, a kit, an ear, you know, ear gray, aqua to use, rewater, something like that. You can basically go to a plumbing store and get all the things you need. And they're a lot cheaper than some of the higher end proprietary systems. The limitations of this system are, it's definitely a more elaborate system uh, than gravity flow. There's more parts, there's more stuff that might potentially go wrong. The system itself does have a carbon footprint. So there is uh, energy associated with the, using the pump. And there's also just the carbon footprint of the stuff, the, the fiberglass tanks, the PVC pipes that you might need, the pump itself. So that is something that we do like, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna spend or, or you know, use a huge amount of stuff con constructing your gray water system, it is worth thinking about that in the context of how, how of offsetting how much water you're gonna be saving. It's more expensive than gravity flow systems. Uh, you may need to install an electrical outlet, so then you've potentially got another trade coming in. Uh, and there's always with these, you know, more elaborate stuff with pumps, there is the possibility of pump failure or other mechanical problems. So we're going to talk about that and ways to avoid those. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions so far, so I'm just going to launch into it. I'm going to go through a system that we just installed a few days ago and kind of take you through it from start to finish. So um, you start with a hole in the ground. That's where your pump basin is going to go. And we'll talk later about how to figure out where that's going to be. Um, and this is an overview of the system. So the bigger pipe coming out of the house is sewer. That's going out to a sewer lateral. That's um, labeled down below at the bottom of the drawing. Uh, the top pipe, the smaller pipe, which is two inch, is um, that's gray water. So we've already gone under the house. This is an existing house, not, not new construction. So our plumber went in and pulled the gray water fixtures off the sewer line and, and stubbed them out at this point. There's the three port diverter valve that allows you to send water either back to the sewer. If you are doing something with bleach or salt, that's going to harm the soil. Uh, and right now it is actually set to sewer. If you see where that location is, um, by manually turning that valve, you can you send the water to the blue pump basin. And these pumps are, it's like a sump pump or a sewage ejector pump. It is a submersible pump. The pump itself sits in the water inside that basin. There's a float switch. So as water enters the tank, the float switch rises. And when it gets to a certain height, it will turn on the pump and shoot all the water out to irrigation. So you're not storing water. It's even though that you see a tank, uh, this is something that's important for building inspectors or um, plant checkers to know you're, you're not storing water in that tank. It's basically like a sewage ejector pump or a sump pump. Water enters and is more or less immediately shot out to, um, to irrigation. Uh, on the far right, the pipe with that round circle, there's an overflow back to the sewer line with a backwater valve on it. The reason for that is if the power is out or if there's a pump malfunction or if there's more, entrance, more water entering the system, then the pump can handle, it'll simply overflow back to the sewer and it won't cause any um, problems. You don't want gray water bubbling up out of your ground or in your crawl space. On the top of the pump, there's a future connection to the vent. This was done, um, this picture was taken in the middle of an installation, so it's not fully hooked up. Pumped water out to irrigation and a vent hookup. So I'm gonna pause for just a minute and let everyone digest this. And if anyone has any questions, please enter them now and we will um, we'll see what we can do. I'll probably pause to take questions about three or four times during the presentation. Uh, and I can't hear you, but I can see apparently uh, if people start texting me. Or, uh, someone has just written, is 30 gallon a standard capacity for pumps such as these? Uh, yes, this is what we usually, um, 
This is the size we usually use. Um, it's you can use smaller basins. You can use larger. I know if you look at the rewater, they've got 70 gallon and 110 gallons. Uh, you want enough capacity so that it shoots out water in a pretty big bulk, like 10 or 15 gallons at a time. Uh, and because if you ha might have like 30 emitter outlets, then each one would get about one gallon. If you have a smaller pump basin capacity, it shoots out smaller amounts of water, and it's, it's harder to get an even distribution of water through all the emitters in the yard. How far deep do homeowners need to dig the pump basin? Well, if you uh, you need to dig it <laughs> below the um, wherever your gray water stub out is, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but it's it is important. A lot of um, it's, that's a good question because sewer lines, sewers in the street are often you know way underground, six or eight feet or or lower. So in a lot of houses, plumbers do not pay a lot of attention to keeping lines high. Uh, you know, drain lines from bathtubs can go down, but they cannot go back up. So your pump tank is going to be lower than your lowest uh, pipe, uh, and everything's flowing downhill. Um, I've got another question. What signals the diverter valve to send salt, et cetera, to the sewer pipe? The homeowner. <laughs> that is your responsibility. And this one has a manual valve. Uh, it's hand-operated. Usually, we will put on a electric remote actuator operated by a switch. And I think you, you guys have already talked about that. You'll see some pictures of it, but I won't go into it in great detail. But that is up to the owner. Most. Oh, hello. Um, this is sure. Laura. I just want to interrupt for one sec. And Lee's referring there in our previous webinar series. There was one on gray water plumbing that covered the gray water diverter valves and the actuators. So that's the reference that I believe many of you saw. Uh, I've got a, another question. Is one able to collect the gray water in a basin in the basement and pump it out to the yard? Not in the state of California. And I think most gray water plumbing codes you need to have the ability to send gray water either to uh, the sewer or to the irrigation. Uh, and if your basement is below the sewer line, then uh, you won't have the option to drain water down and uh, shoot it out to uh, the sewer unless you have a sewage ejector pump as a separate pump. Um, so, sorry if that's a little arcane. We'll, we'll get into that maybe a little more. And I'm going to do one more question, and then we'll, I'll get back into the presentation. Are there very small units that would push washing machine water up a site hill? Yes. Uh, you can look up SaniFlow, S-A-N-I-F-L-O. That's a company that makes stuff like that. Uh, do you routinely cut into foundations? One last question. Uh, we often will have to core through a, a foundation, um, but you'll see other installations where we haven't. Um, so I'm going to go on with a sort of a typical installation. Uh, thank you all for your questions. Those are really good. Everyone's like on the ball. And, and I'm going to mention one thing. This is going to this this came up earlier, and I want to just mention it on this slide. You can't see it, but there's there's a flange on the top of the basin where the basin is about 18 inches in diameter, and then there's a flange that sticks out, so it's about 24 inches in diameter. On the bottom, there's a similar flange, and there's there's actually an important reason for that is that in wet environments where the ground is going to get totally saturated if the water table rises up the basin itself can uplift and if anyone has ever tried to hold a basketball or a beach ball underwater in a swimming pool there's a tremendous amount of force that water can push up a empty basin and these basins are empty most of the time it's the same problem with septic tanks and things like that if if the groundwater or the water table gets too high the basin itself will uplift and it can really wreak havoc on your system. So uh, this is an official sewage ejector pump basin. It's got a flange on the bottom that prevent, it locks it in the ground and prevents uplift. Um, so here's the system in the top view. Uh, uh, my thing is being a little cut off. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a sewer line down below and the, um, the smaller line, similar to the other one, the big line, the big pipes are sewer pipes. The two inch pipes are uh, gray water pipes. This was a project that the house contractor stubbed it out for us. And what he had done was he had just connected the gray water pipe to the sewer pipe. And then he was done. We took over. And this is, we installed pretty much everything you can see except for the large round pipe on the left and the, and the stub out. So there's a little clean on the gray water side, which is cut off. So it just says 
otter. Um, there is a little clean out and then water is flowing to the diverter valve. This is at the moment a hand operated diverter valve uh, that will send water going either to the pump basin or back to the sewer. Uh, water inside the basin can flow either out to the, um, to the pump where it gets pumped out. Um, the two bottom outlets are on the left. There's an overflow back to the sewer. Um, we always put in some kind of overflow. That's a safety issue. You know, if there's no power and the pump isn't working, um, you do not want gray water to um, exit in some place where, <laughs> where you don't want it. The, the very bottom pipe on the, on the slide is actually a auto flush. And I'll show you, I'll talk more about those. But what that is, is a system that we often install that uh, shoots in a few gallons of water every day, every 24 hours, and it cycles the pump and it cleans, it's fresh water. So it just cycles the pump and flushes out all the gray water lines. Um, moving on from there, uh, this is the system with the lid in place. Um, we've gone a little farther. There's a grommet that's going to go in to protect those wires. Um, and you can see a little bit more of the auto flush, which is the, the, on the far left, there's a white thing. That is an air gap. So we've got fresh water coming down from the city through a P-trap and then going back into the tank. And that's just a fresh water flush to flush out the tank. Um, going on to the next one, we are proud of our work. We're documenting it. This, this was a very narrow space we had to work in. Um, so this was all um, underneath a, we had to cut out a little section of walkway and we are recompacting the soil here. And then we have replaced everything and you would never even know. Um, so let's see what you have. Um, going back to this slide, um, I'm going to um, let's see. I'm going to take another quick break. Uh, I've got one question that just came in. It says, "What if you have 30 feet from the interior source to the exterior wall and the pump?" Uh, it's not so much the lateral distance as the slope of your pipes and sewer pipes. Any waste piping is to follow the basic plumbing code, which is that it has to drop quarter inch per foot. So uh, 30 feet is fine as long as you drop one quarter inch for every 30 feet, I mean, for every foot, which is um, someone else can do the math, but it's about seven and a half inches, I think, of drop over that 30 feet. Um, and uh, then you'll be fine. Um, the next thing I wanna to talk to about is where do you put the pump? Because there are various options. Usually we've got a situation like the one shown where there is a, it's called the sewer lateral. That's it's where the sewer main of the building, all the gray water, I mean, all the, when you, when you, when a plumber plumbs a house normally, everything gets, you know, plumbed together in a confluence of pipes, like a giant river, always sloping downhill and it goes out of the house. And then it's called the sewer lateral connects the house to the street. That's also downhill. It's all gravity flow in most cases. Um, so we know that we can get gray water to that point because it's, we know that it's far enough downhill. Sometimes the sewer pipe will exit the building quite a few feet below grade, uh, in which case I'll show you a slide in the, in the future. You may need to pump put your pump basin quite a few feet below grade if, you're, if your pipes are all coming out too low. Um, the other option is to replumb the fixtures higher up uh, and keep all your uh, pipes higher so that you're not um, so low. But if your, your tank is uh, down underground, you can get riser extensions. So it's basically like um, a 12 inch lift or, or so you still have this manhole cover on top, but you can um, extend the top of the basin. Uh, we usually, someone writes in, how much space did you have under to work with? Uh, this particular one was pretty small. Um, most crawl spaces in LA, I mean, here in Los Angeles, there's a lot of bungalows, a lot of craftsmen. There are single family homes on single lots with a crawl space, you know, built between the, you know, tens and the fifties when they started pouring slabs. So a lot of the work we do is there. Sometimes, you know, crawl spaces are legally nowadays, they have to be, I think, eight, 18 inches or something. But back in the day, sometimes you'll have some that are 12 inches tall between the ground and the joists. And we've had to work in some really um, rather tight situations. Um, 
So in this, talking more about the pump location, where do you put it? This is at the sewer lateral where it exits the house. So we've, we've separated gray water and black water and they both come out at the same place. Um, this, in this version, we are up, away from the sewer lateral and there's a bathroom right above, right above this, um, you know, in the house right next door. And we are coming out with our gray water and there's the three port diverter valve. And then to get back to the sewer, we are going back into the house. So we are not close to the sewer lateral in this particular drawing to the sewer main. Um, we are coming out of the house and back in. And this can be done if you've got like a bathroom or something that's kind of remote from everything else. Um, so uh, next slide, this is that same project, a little more filled in. So we've got our valves in place, um, going back to that. There's the diverter valve is the one with the handle and the one with the cap is a backwater valve. Uh, that's important because if you've got sewer water backing up, the last thing you want is for it to go backwards up the pipes and flow into the tank where it would then be pumped out to irrigation. So it's very important to include a backwater valve. We're gonna, you're gonna see something like that on all of our installations because that's a pretty important component. Um, so that's the system. This is it a little more filled in. Uh, and the thing on top is the auto flush. That's um, a little air gap allowing you to flush out the system with fresh water every night. And this is the system all sort of finished and ready to go. Um, so uh, here's another version of a similar scenario. This is one, this is a smaller, a little more informal. I think this is more like a 20 gallon basin. Um, you know, it, if you use all the fiberglass tanks and everything, it can be a pretty expensive um, installation. The fiberglass tank is probably 200 bucks plus. Um, this is more just a barrel, so it's a little more um, inexpensive and user friendly. Um, the purple line is the gray water being pumped out to irrigation. And we had to, some of the white lines, the white pipes, the PVC, those are actually existing irrigation pipes that we had to relocate. So, um, cause our, they were right in the way of our system. So we put that in. Um, another version of the same deal is you might have to put it under a, it's the same deal, a pump basin. Um, this one's under a, a deck and then we cut a little access hatch. Um, Moving on with other examples, here's one that was delicately placed in the shrubbery below some stairs. This was one we did quite a few years back. There's a blue thing on the left of the picture. That is a filter. Um, we no longer do filters. <laughs> so, but it's basically the, the plumbing and the pump and everything is about the same on this kind of system. Um, so uh, someone writes in there's a question that says, what is a typical installation cost, not including the repaving, et cetera? So that's a good question. A typical installation involves three components. There's replumbing the house underneath, you know, like separating the black water, the gray water lines from the sewer and, and replumbing it out to gray water. Um, the second part is installing the, the system, the pump, the valves, the basin, all that stuff, the electrical. And then the third component is installing the irrigation. Um, Typically, these might be around six thousand dollars, you know. And we're using licensed plumbers and everything like that. You could probably find people to do it for cheaper, but um, they may not. Um, <laughs> they might not be doing everything perfectly up to code. Um, so uh, another question comes in. Let's see. General ideas: if and when on slab. Uh, get a concrete saw or hire someone. Is it you know in LA you can hire concrete cutters. It's usually about 200 or 300 bucks to come out and cut a hole in a slab. Uh, CSC concrete coring, actually doing the work. Good idea. Bad idea. Cost. Um, yeah, if you're on a slab. Oh, uh, actually, it sounds like maybe the question is if the home is on a concrete slab. So uh, hopefully this was covered in the previous webinars, but. Um, there are two two situations that make uh, gray water systems slightly difficult. One is when you've got second story bathrooms where potentially all the water is going down one pipe, then you have to cut open the ceiling and replumb. And uh, that's a kind of elaborate. If you've got a, a home with a slab on grade foundation, you should just give it up because you're not gonna do gray water unless you tear down the whole place and replumb it. Um, 
I'm getting a lot of questions and I'm going to have to probably move ahead. So um, let me keep on going with these pictures and then we'll take a break in a few minutes. Um, next one. So we also do a lot of them in crawl spaces and uh, probably I prefer to put the pump basin outside because it does need a annual more or less access. You are going to have to go in there and check on the pump every once in a while. Uh, we usually set up a once a year cleaning, you know, maintenance program for our systems. So we just check in. You don't need to do much, but you do need to occasionally look inside and just make sure that the pump is still working. Um, so uh, one caveat I will say about putting pump basins in a crawl space is that you need to have not only enough space in the crawl space, but you need to have a big enough access. And most crawl space accesses are 18 by 24 inches. Um, these pump basins are usually about 19 inches in diameter. So if you can't get the basin into the crawl space, that's a potential problem. Uh, in this picture, you can see gray water coming from the upper right behind that wooden beam. And the thing with the little blue label on it is a remote actuator. So whenever you put a gray water system, a, a, a valve in a crawl space, people are going to need to um, uh, turn that with, turn that valve handle without um, going into the crawl space because that would really put a damper on your relaxing um, salt bath if you had to then climb under your crawl space and turn it back to um, to, to gray water. So uh, it, it's called a remote actuator. It's operated by a switch in the house. So it it's there's a just a, a wall switch that will turn uh, this valve handle either to gray water or sewer. And you can see gray water either goes into the pump basin or into the sewer system. The big pipe right in the foreground at the bottom is the sewer main. And then the round cap is the um, backwater valve. And the white PVC pipe is pressured uh, it's gray water going out. Um, and if you're really lucky, you get uh, the system in a nice basement such as this. Um, and gray water is coming down from the top and the sewer line is going down into the concrete slab. Uh, or like this, this is super high tech. This is all cast iron plumbing, um, which was a pretty high end house. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is, this is one of the more high end, um, uh, installations that we've done. And I am going to take a quick pause. <laughs> um, <laughs> let, me, let me interrupt for one sec. I want to, I want to recommend sure. that you go farther because some of the questions are going to get answered. So maybe you can... Go to the end, and then we'll have time because the questions are kind of hitting all sorts of different parts of the installation. Yeah, okay. That sounds good. Thanks, Laura. Um, so next, we're going to talk about irrigation. How do these systems actually work in the landscape? So this is a plan. This was part of a uh, permit um, drawing set that we submitted. Um, you can see where I've labeled the system start. The dark hatched outlines, and if you do full screen, you can probably see it a little better um but uh it's it's not as as easy to see the, the the dark hatch circles and semicircles are um mulch basins and we'll see what those actually look like um so this is a number of fruit trees and shade trees that are all being irrigated with gray water um and in california you have certain you know the gray water code dictates that you are not allowed to go right up against buildings and up against the property line so the, the inspectors are going to be looking at, do you have, um, are you respecting the um, setbacks from property lines and structures? And also they're going to look at the total area of um, irrigation. So one of the concerns about gray water system is, is you don't want to put so much water out into the landscape that it's running off. So having properly sized mulch basins is going to help with that. Um, in the landscape, it's a lot like a laundry to landscape distribution system. So we've got mainline tubing, that's the bigger tube, that's the pressurized pipe coming from the pump, and T's coming off it, and each T is going to have a little um, ball valve at the end. You can barely see it. There's a little green topped valve. Um, at no point does the tubing ever get smaller than half inch diameter, and that's important because there is stuff in gray water. There's laundry lint, there's soap suds. Um, any kind of time you're setting up soaker hose or drip line, uh, it's going to clog with gray water and you're not allowed to spray gray water. Um, uh, in California, it has to be two inches below grade. So, uh, you shouldn't ever actually be seeing any, um, 
any gray, you know, if gray water is daylighting, then that's a potential code violation in California. Um, so this is a finished mulch basin with a pumped system. There's a, this is a trench. The wood chips you see are in a trench. The trench is about a foot deep and it's pulled in. So we, it's, you know, filled with wood chips and that the wood chips do three things. They, they um, contain the gray water. So it soaks into the, into the wood chips and doesn't sheet off or flow off on the landscape. Uh, they, um, they allow it to percolate out horizontally. So, and they also kind of filter gray water. So the percolation aspect is, you know, if you have drip line, you've got hundreds of little emitters all over the place, or if you're spraying gray water, you're not allowed to spray it. So you're dumping a lot more water into limited number of outlet points. The, the mulch will allow the gray water to spread out laterally horizontally through the, through the landscape. Um, so uh, here is the actual emitter and it's a little bit dirty. You know, you can see the mulch, like the, the basin fills up with water um, there's the mulch, there's, uh, the emitter outlet is this tiny valve, uh, water does shoot out of it rather forcefully. So, but it's contained, you know, usually it would have a lid on it. You can, you can see, um, you'll see later on some of the lids we use. Um, but you do, you can adjust how much water comes out of each individual outlet by turning this, the green valve. Um, it's a little ball valve. Um, you know, you can see, uh, you're not going to control the, the total amount of water going into the system is dictated by how many baths and showers and laundry people in the house are doing and whether or not they shut off the system with the, with the diverter valve. So what the valve does, this little green valve does, is it balances the system so you can uh, distribute the water evenly or get more water or less water on certain plants. Um, and this is a uh, sort of a close-up showing um, some emitter outlets. Here's a couple more. Um, so all this wood chip area is going to be, uh, you know, water, gray water will be percolating out through it and going to those plants. And these little, these are nice little uh, valve boxes. Or these are rectangular ones. We'll use either rectangular ones or round. Um, these actually say, if you find these, they're, they say non-potable water, do not drink, which is really cool. Um, Another thing we sometimes do, and this is not as easy to pull off, but if you do have a raised bed or a landscape where you've got a lot of little plantings, um, it's hard to irrigate uh, all those little things. Uh, with fruit trees or trees, shade trees, the root systems of the trees will find the water. This is something we do. It's a larger diameter. Um, it's half inch tubing and we'll drill holes in it and then put a sheaf over each hole so you don't have gray water spraying out. Um, it's kind of like a homemade drip line. You probably want your holes to be big, like quarter inch, uh, anything smaller than that will eventually clog. Um, and then you do have to cover the whole thing with mulch. So in California, it has to be two inches of mulch to get your um, required two inch coverage. Uh, but it is a way to spread the gray water out a little more finely over something like a vegetable garden. If you're going to do something like this in a vegetable garden, these um, holes will get kind of dis disturbed each year when they um, when they dig up the vegetables and replant. So something like this, you could you know just move the drip line out of the way, plant replant your garden and stuff like that. Um, Lee, if I if I could interject there that that the quarter inch holes they will clog and and they will need more maintenance <laughs> than the other kind. Yeah, we, um, yeah, Laura is right. They will, um, if we do these kind of systems, we usually will do, instead of annual maintenance, we do every six inch, uh, every six uh, month, um, some kind of visit. Um, so, before uh, you go on, could you just, Lee, sorry, before you go on, could you clarify that what you use to cover the outlet? There was a question about that last image. Uh, you mean, oh, this the, one? The C. Yeah, the sheaths. Yeah, exactly if you, uh, so gray water, you know, the pumps are quite forceful. Um, they're almost, you know, as strong as, as city water pressure. So what, if you drill a hole in a, in the smaller pipe, when you, when the pump kicks on, it will s squirt showers of gray water up in the air <laughs> or all over the place. Uh, so the sheath is simply covers that hole. So it percolates out through the two ends of the 
you know, it, it doesn't, it prevents the water from spraying up in the air or sort of getting all over the place. And it also maybe helps a little bit with just clogging and root intrusion into the gray water system. Um, so hopefully that is clear. clear. Um, I'm going to look at the questions really quick. Uh, let's see, everyone's hearing fine. Here, here I can, um, Lee, I'm going to summarize. There was a question, but you're probably going to talk about it right now, about how high and how far the pump can pump. Yes. And there was a question about the auto flush. Are you going to come back to that? I'm going to come back to all that stuff. Yeah, so the next thing I'm going to do is just talk. I'm, I'm almost done with the system generally, and I'm going to go over some of the details. I know these are complicated, and there's, there's, it seems like there's a lot of smart people with really good questions who are really, like, getting to the heart of things. But getting now into some of the details, and then we'll sort of open it up. So um, one of the, the, the most important sort of the heart of your system is the pump. Um, and this is one we commonly use. It is a Dayton 4HU73, and it is an effluent pump. So effluent pumps are designed to handle, um, you know, dirty water, basically water that may have hair, soap suds. It may be very alkaline or very acidic. Um, so it's a pretty robust pump. It, you know, it's submersible, so it sits underwater. They are prone to... You know, if you get cheap pumps, they're going to fail. So you need to spend a little money on this one. This one isn't too bad. It's probably about $350, $400. Um, so I think I've seen them for $350 or less. Uh, and it's kind of a standard if you have a flat lot and you're not irrigating, you know, like um, huge distances, this would be fine. The thing on the right, the chart, is a standard pump curve. And this gives you information about that pump. So what it is showing you is if you're pumping the water up higher, um, that is head feet. And you can also generate head feet by, by um, the, the piping itself will cause sort of resistance to, this, to the um, water flow that's analogous to pumping water uphill. But in this system, at uh, for example, if you're pumping 20 gallons of water a minute, so we're looking at the bottom line, 20 GPM, you can get that water up to about 28 feet high. Or, or conversely, if you've got a hillside and there's something 28 feet high, it's going to flow at 20 gallons per minute. If you've got something at 35 feet high, no water is going to get there. It's, this pump capacity is only about 31 feet. So, And we've had some hillside projects in LA where we've had to go up 60 feet when you need something like that, then um, you're going to need to get a high head effluent pump. Um, and so getting more into detail about pumps, um, there are, I've had other, there's something called a junk pump. There are other kinds of pumps, but we usually use either an effluent pump or a sewage pump. So they're handle, they're, they're built to handle all kinds of crud. Um, so this, this dangling thing in front, the wire, that is a float switch. So as water enters the tank, it starts floats up, and when it gets to be above the pump, usually it'll turn the pump on and shoot the water out. And then as the water goes down, the float switch will drop. Here's what one looks like in the field. And I'm going to mention this. This is kind of a minor point. But when we do gray water systems, we try to set it up so that the they pump more water in greater amounts less often. So you don't want the pump cycling on and off with short bursts of water. You want the tank to get pretty full and then um, shoot the water out, you know, so you get like a good 15 gallon or 20 gallon um, amount of water coming out in one burst. And the black thing floating in the water is the float switch. In this picture, we've actually, we've got a long tether. So this is, so we, we extended the, the cable where the float from the pump, the, you know, in this picture, <laughs> In this picture, the float switch is quite close to the to the um, where it's mounted. Um, in this one, you can see the float the float part is on a longer cord away from the pump, so that gives you a greater amount of water per um, uh, per time the pump turns on. This is another kind of this is a very small tank we had to do, and the float switch in this one is the white bulbous rounded thing connected. It's sort of uh, right right next to the pump. Hopefully there's a few white things on this picture. Um, this is a vertical float switch. It's, a, it, it's more of a sump pump. 
it shoots the water out in smaller bursts. So you might only get like five gallons out at a time. Um, so you need to make sure when your pipes aren't, and tubing aren't all full of water, if uh, the water doesn't just go into the tubing and then the pump shuts off and the water flows back down to the lowest outlet. Um, this next picture shows a pre-packaged pump unit. So this is if someone is building a, a bathroom in their basement, you're probably gonna need a sewage ejector pump. This is not designed for gray water, it's designed for black water, for sewage ejector. And the float switch in this one is the gray thing. Uh, as you can see, it's really high. So you're always gonna have several inches of gray water or water in the bottom of this tank. With gray water systems, we don't really want that water. You want to mount the flow switch low so that it pumps out as much water at a time as possible. Um, but sometimes, you know, this might be, you know, a, a thing that you need to use. I can't exactly think of why, but we have used once or twice a prepackaged pump unit, and they are they are pretty um, robust. But they don't, you know, uh, we prefer to mount our own um, uh, our own pumps and float switches. So another detail that you're going to see is the backwater valve. I talked about, about this a lot. Um, and the, the picture on the bottom right shows the water flow from right to the left following the arrow. There's a flapper that simply opens up when water is flowing uh, through the system. But then if water tries to go backwards, it closes. Uh, this is super important to have this. Um, you know, usually it's a two inch valve, but you can get them in uh, two or three or four inch uh, sizes. Um, and you'll see those on all of our installations. Um, the auto flush, someone asked about this. I really like these. And, you know, as we all know, hopefully, gray water standing in a tank will start to turn septic after 24 hours. So there's always some small amount of water at the bottom of these tanks. Even when the pump is finished pumping, uh, there's an inch or two at the bottom uh, of the tank. If the owner goes on vacation for a few days, that water is going to get kind of funky. What the auto flush does is it shoots in maybe five gallons or so, maybe 10 every night, and it cycles the pump and flushes out the water. Uh, it's sometimes we call it a um, makeup water because you can also use it to extend the amount of water, you know, extend the reach of your gray water system. Uh, so by putting extra drinking water into your gray water system, uh, you are still irrigating, you know, you can irrigate more with the gray water system by adding fresh water. Um, so uh, hopefully you guys can all hear me okay. Um, Anyway, this is this is kind of a low tech auto flush. It's a single station battery operated timer. It's very intuitive to use, easy to use, um, and it, you know set it for you know two minutes every night, and that's probably about ten gallons. Um, one really important thing with the auto flush is to have an air gap. So on the picture on the right, the thing, the white thing right below the um, below the valve timer is an air gap, and that is a physical drop from city water, municipal water supply is coming in from the top, and gray water, which is the black pipe down below. Health inspectors love to see these. Um, it is more foolproof than an RPZ valve. It is a physical drop, a break where water is coming down from below, falling through space, and then going into the gray water system. Uh, anytime you've got a connection between a potable or a municipal water supply and a gray water system, you need to be very mindful of what's called cross connection. Um, in other words, the potential for injecting pressurized gray water or even non-pressurized gray water back into the city municipal water supply. So the air gap um, makes that um, pretty much impossible for that kind of um, problem to happen. Uh, so another version of that is, this is a much cleaner Lee. version. Hello, Laura. Uh, hello, Lee. Before you go to the next picture, actually, could probably go back. There's a question about that blue filter. Oh. <laughs> well, and there was another question before about why you aren't using these filters anymore. So you could hit both those questions at once. Yeah. Um, this one does have the blue filter. This was a, a proprietary system called Eerie Gray. Um, it, it's a gray water compatible drip line. And we did do a bunch of these. Not every single one of them failed, but enough of them <laughs> had problems that we stopped doing them. And with this type of system, 
the homeowner or someone has to clean the, the, fil the filter once a month. And gray water filters are yucky. It's sort of kind of like a sink trap. It's slimy, it's smelly, and you need to sponge this thing, you know, sort of squeeze out this spongy filter element. And it became something that people just weren't doing, or it would be they do it the first month and never again. If, and once the filter clogs, then the pump can't pump through, the pump burns out, and they've lost a $350 pump, and the whole thing becomes, you know, it's kind of annoying and problematic. Uh, so, yeah, it's any kind of system where the homeowner has to clean a filter is, is going to be a problem. Uh, there are some systems that are m higher end, like rewater and water renew and things that apparently have self-cleaning filters, but I'm not still sold on those. Uh, you know, there, there are systems that automatically back flush and clean a filter, but I think you're going to get into more of those down the line in the seminar. But I would be, I would be a little leery of systems that are super high tech um, because you're just going to end up with, you know, sort of systems upon systems and there's just a lot more maintenance and a lot more things to break. Um, here's another auto flush. This one's using an irrigation timer and an irrigation valve, which is down on the bottom right. You can barely see the valve and then coming up through the tan, uh, that's UV protected PVC and then through the air gap, which is the white thing in the sort of upper left of the picture. Um, Moving on from there, I've only got a couple more slides. In fact, I think I have one more slide, which is this. This is called an indexing valve. This is just a detail that we sometimes do. Um, I didn't really get into this, but each zone, we usually limit to about 20 irrigation outlets. We've got some projects where we'll want to do 40 or 60. So the indexing valve allows you to extend the reach of the system and have different zones. And all it is is a system that each time the pump kicks on, it switches to a new zone. It sort of indexes, so it goes around in a circle. I think this one has three different valves. So water is coming from the uh, pump basin, which is the big black thing on the left, to the indexing valve, and then it shoots out through the different zones, you know, sort of sequentially one after the other. The large bulky white things are check valves. So we, if, if you're irrigating uphill, from the gray water system, all the water in the pipes is gonna flow back into the tank after the pump turns off. So those check valves prevent that from happening. And one other detail is that this was a system where we did end up having to come out of the house really low. So the pump basin is actually below the, um, it's out of sight. The black cylindrical thing is a riser extension. So that's where we put our, um, uh, our, uh, just, to, to, you know, so you can put the, the pump basin farther below ground and still have access to it. Um, and this is my last slide. Go, sorry, can, can you go back yeah. to that? And can you clarify, I know some indexing valves require a certain amount of pressure. Could you tell people what pump and what model valve you, indexing valve you use? Oh, in there, is, there is one indexing valve, and I don't remember it, it's you do need a, a high pressure and it's at least 10 psi it's probably more because it's it's yeah a sort of a rotating thing has to have enough water pressure to seal uh you also they do sometimes leak the indexing valve so you you have to put them outside there's one that we found that is compatible with recycled water um and i don't know i'm i i would tell you if i knew but i, I can't remember how we found it. I think it's made by Rainbird, but I'm not even totally sure. Um, so unfortunately, I, I, I don't have that information with me, but it's- Well, you could get, you know, if we you, can, if anyone asks, we can get back to them. If anyone wants yeah, to absolutely. Know. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's the one we try to find is, is actually actuated with a lower PSI and is compatible with gray water because it does, there is a thing that will, has to seal. So if you get slimy crud on it from gray water, <laughs> then that will um, hopefully still seal properly. Um, and there was a question a couple, about how many zones you can have with it. You can, valve. when you buy the indexing valve, you can get, um, you buy it in, it comes, I've seen them go up to six zones. Um, usually we just do two. Um, we've done, I think this one's three, but you can, you, when you buy it, it'll tell you, you know, you specify um, what it, what it can do. 
Um, another potential thing that we have been doing, which I think is kind of awesome, is instead of an indexing valve, have a remote actuator on a three-port valve. So there's one inlet and two outlets. And we did one recently where it switched between a front yard and a backyard every on a weekly timer. So we had three days in the front yard and four days in the backyard. And that actually prevented one of the problems that some of these gray water systems have where you've got a constant low grade moisture in the environment. If you've got a system that switches, you know, sort of on a weekly basis between different zones, it does allow the different zones to dry out, which um, some plants really appreciate that. Uh, not all plants like to be sort of constantly moist. Um, the typical PSI, um, the Dayton, it's probably about 40 PSI, um, but you know, you can, you can get, there's hundreds, there's thousands of pumps out there and you can get higher PSI, higher head pumps. Um, house uh, water pressure is typically 60 or 80 PSI. Um, just so that gives you a sense of, you know, these aren't quite as strong as, as like a water pressure from a garden hose, but they're pretty close. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, we have gone back to systems that we've installed years ago and they have been more or less going strong all these years. In order to do that, you do have to get, you have to invest some money in the pump um, because that is the number one source of failure. And um, I mentioned that we've got pump failure. The, the main times I have had to replace pumps have been because there's been a filter that wasn't cleaned. The pump was pumping and pumping and pumping. Sometimes you'll even come to a house and the pump will be on the water will be churning the water will be in the tank but it won't it can't go out of the tank because the filters are clogged and the the tank itself will be hot like hot to, you can't even touch it because of the there's so much um energy being consumed by this by this pump working um so uh don't use filters use a good effluent or scrooge pump uh the other problem is broken or uh broken float switches or um the pump the float switch getting hung up so I was talking earlier about extending the length of the float switch so you have a longer tether. Uh, the danger with that, you have to strike a balance because if the float switch is really long, there is a potential for it to get tangled up or to get caught on something. And if it's caught in the down position, the pump will keep running and never stop and burn up. Uh, if it's caught in the up position, the pump will never turn on. Maybe I got that backwards. <laughs> anyway, you know what I'm saying. Uh, if it's caught in the up position, the pump will actually keep on going forever. If it's caught in the down position, the pump will never turn on and the gray water system will not be functioning. Uh, we've had problems with GFI outlets tripping. Um, that's pretty easy to fix. Uh, and if you're used to doing something like a laundry to landscape system, some of you guys have done those, um, those are low, low pressure. You know, they're about five PSI uh, or less. These are more like 40 or 60. So you do have to pay attention to your connections because it is a higher pressure system. Uh, you know, it's basically as strong as, um, as normal house pressure. And then the occasional maintenance issue is the, the mulch basins um, or the, the mulch shields, the little valve boxes that protect the valves, those can get full of muck. If in a rainstorm, everything gets filled up. So you, all you simply do is just go in with a trowel and clean everything out and it'll be fine. Um, other maintenance issues are, you know, mulch basins subsiding, the mulch, the wood chips will turn back into soil. Um, that's all healthy and good. It'll be awesome soil, but you will have to do some maintenance and just add some wood chips. So um, that concludes my presentation part. I'm going to go back. Um, Laura, have you been looking at the questions? Is there anything we need to talk about? Yeah, there's a couple of ones. One is, could you clarify the, how the, you did the system which switches between the front and the backyard? Um, yeah, I can, uh, uh, I can, uh, I don't have a picture of it, but what we did, we used a three port valve, just like a diverter valve on a gray water system. Um, those diverter valves have one inlet and then you can switch between two outlets. It's the same deal, except there is a, um, the two outlets are the front yard and the backyard. And we used a one week as a timer made by a company called Intermatic. And it's a one week, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, seven day timer. Uh, so you can switch basically, you know, you can do uh, two days front yard, two days backyard, three, you know, but uh, you, can, um, you can do things like that. Um, 
So it's it's a little complicated. It's sort of like something we just started doing and tried to figure out. But um, you know, I'll be glad to to answer anyone's questions on um, various forums or or uh, work with you guys to figure it all out. Um, I just had a new one come in. Any info on rise in energy consumption bills? Yeah, you know, the pumps are not on very much. I don't have any information about that. You could do the math. The pumps generally run for maybe about um, 20 minutes a day or something like that. Um, in the context of energy consumption of a gray water system, here in Los Angeles, our drinking water comes from sources 450 miles away, going across deserts, pumped over mountains. You know, we go uh, over the Los Angeles, uh, the um, Tehachapi Mountains. So water is actually pumped 400 miles to get to Los Angeles. In that context, people are irrigating with drinking water. So what we're trying to do, <laughs> instead of pumping drinking water 450 miles across the state to water your plants, we want to pump it 20 feet up into your backyard. So in the in that context, gray water is a fantastic deal. Um, but yeah, there is there is a small amount of electrical consumption, but uh, you know based on um, the pump going off. But it's it's only on when you know you know it cycle you know when someone's taking a shower, it'll cycle on and off a few times. Uh, and that, more Lee, that that brings to a question that came up earlier, just to clarify when a pump is necessary. Well, um, a pump is necessary. Any, t you know, our, our usually our first idea when we go to a house will be to try to do a gravity flow system. So if we've got um, area to be irrigated downhill from the house, but the limitations of gravity flow system are it has to be downhill. You're probably only going to be able to do one zone, like a front yard or a backyard. Um, so you know it's a single area where the water is flowing to. Um, so we would use a pump if the area to be irrigated is above the house, gravity's not going to work. Or if you want to really spread the water out, um, if someone has dozens of fruit trees or things in the front yard and the backyard, or maybe wants to have, you know, 40 emitter outlets instead of just eight, which is about as much as you're going to get with a, with a gravity flow system. Um, and then, you know, there's also laundry to landscape systems. Those can go a little bit uphill, but it's just a washing machine. So this is usually bathtubs and showers. Um, and uh, yeah, getting that water out and all around and uphill. Um, so someone asked about the air gap. Um, there's a, if you you'll have to Google and Google air gaps. There are various versions. Uh, it, it looks kind of small. It is it is UPC approved. Uh, that's important. Make sure it's UPC listed. There's one out there that um, it's called a better air gap and apparently they say that they're UPC listed, but they are not. <laughs> I learned that the hard way. <laughs> so um, an air gap is a physical drop through space and there's certain, if in the California plumbing code, they list the requirements. Um, basically the drop has to be uh, twice the diameter of the pipe, I think that's going into it. Um, someone says, this is a good question. Why do you need a trap on the line going to the gray water from the auto flush? So I could probably find a picture of that if I went back a ways. Oh, here's one. There is a P trap. So auto flush goes down. There's a P flush at the bottom, and then it goes back into the tank. Gray water tanks, even super clean gray water systems, you don't want. Um, they they can be a little smelly. Um, so anytime we've got water in a tank uh, that's connected to a sewage system, it's 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 not clean water, you want to have a P-trap, which seals that off from, uh, you know, the atmosphere around you. Um, it's just sort of a, like anything going into a gray water tank should have a, should have a P-trap on it. That goes for both the fittings, you know, the bathtubs and showers and all that stuff, and also the air gap. Um, I mean, also the auto flush. Um, Laura, did you have anything? We've got one more question that just came in. Valve filters exact same as in irrigation. Uh, there are no filters, so it's it's a valve that is identical to a laundry to landscape system. Um, we use Antelco half inch barbed valves. But you can also use Blue Lock uh, or various other types of fittings. Um, a source for tanks. Uh, you know, we get ours through plumbing. Distribute plumbing supply houses such as Ferguson. Um, there's a big company called Ferguson that sells all kinds of 
um, sort of industrial plumbing supplies. Um, oh, valve timers. <laughs> uh, valve timers, exact same as in irrigation. Uh, yes, it's the same valve timer as in as in fresh water. It's a fresh water valve. Um, so uh, I don't know if you guys can all see the questions. I think not, but someone is asking a question about these valve timers that you see in this picture, are they the same as normal irrigation? Yes, it's a freshwater system. So it can be either a, um, uh, a any kind of freshwater valve. Um, so we're, good, we're pretty close to five o'clock. Laura, is there anything else you wanna yeah. mention or anything Just, you should do to wrap up? Um, one last question is any requirements on P-TRAP location? Uh, well, um, I'm assuming that you're talking about P-traps from the fixtures, um, the I bathtub showers. The P-trap in that picture. Um, you know, it, I think it, as long as you've got a P-trap, you're going to be fine. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of icing on the cake. Someone asked if they're absolutely necessary. Probably not, to be honest. The water in the tank is very clean. It doesn't smell when you're flushing it out. Um, so it's a little bit just of an extra sort of a nice thing that we like to do. Um, it has to be, you know, one thing I would say is where the auto flush enters, that flush water enters the tank should be higher than the overflow. So um, you don't have any potential for, you know, if, if the pump is broken or slow, water is going to flow out the overflow back into the sewer before it um, goes out any kind of auto flush. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So just a couple, I wanted to note a few things. So just for people on the webinar, you know, Lee is a professional and his company is in Dolly's system. So if you're thinking about doing one for yourself, the auto flush, I would say, is definitely optional. But for a professional installation company, they're going to do things a little bit more um, advanced than the homeowner doing the one system for themselves. Um, and I also want to note, there's some questions coming in about other types of irrigation systems that connect into traditional drip irrigation systems, and this one is absolutely separate. There is no connection whatsoever with potable irrigation systems in the yard. We are going to have some webinars coming up on more advanced systems that um, probably are going to be totally separate also, but they are more interconnected into other water systems. So we'll save that topic for a future webinar. And that brings us to the end. So I first want to thank Lee very much for coming on the webinar today for that great presentation and thank everybody for joining us. And I also want to remind people that we have, this is part of a series and you'll have access to any past webinars that happen. So if you want to share this with your friends, colleagues, they won't miss anything. They'll get the recording of this and then be able to participate in all of the future ones. So thanks for joining us, everyone. And Lee, did you have any? I see you're, you're showing some different pictures. Did you want to say any closing thoughts before we end? Uh, no, I think that's about it. There was, um, yeah, yeah. I, I can reiterate that we, if there is an existing irrigation system, we would just do this as an overlay over it and leave it intact. And then just, you know, um, the gray water system is not going to be connected to any kind of existing system. Hopefully, we'll and then turn down the existing irrigation, which is all the, the whole point of it all is to use gray water for irrigation, not drinking water. Um, but yeah, that's that's about it for me. So thank you very much. These are really thoughtful and good questions. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Okay.